ran this experiment with his life. And I'm grateful that he ran it because I don't have to do it. Now, I could run the experiment about what life is all about. But he did it. And some of the things that he found about this life under the sun or things that are done under heaven were some of the things that I have listed on this chart. And I'm not going to read all of these and not going to talk about all of them. But things such as he, he worked on and saw the inequities. He saw that those things that were crooked in this life can't be made straight. And there are things, some things that are needy. People who are wanting and things that need to be done. And they're not going to be taken care of. He made a decision that as he looked at life, it's a lot better to go to places where mourning takes place than places where feasting takes place. Because as he would further say in Ecclesiastes 7, you just learn more lessons. It's, it's, there are things that you need to hear, things that you need to see. He would say things further like uh, that the former days of one's life are not necessarily the good old days like we many times like to think about. He understood that and he found that prosperity and adversity have both have places in this life. And while this is not an exhaustive list of what he found out, what I, want, what I do want to share with you today that, that some of his conclusions that were reached both in the first part of the letter and in the last part are, are similar. Because what he said in chapter 2 and verse 11 is this. He said, Then I looked at all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. He didn't use the term. I'm not sure if the term had ever even been invented yet. But what he felt was frustration. What he felt were the same things you feel when you try to determine why it is that life doesn't fulfill you like you want it to and like I want it to. We stay frustrated. That's exactly what happened to him. And he went on to say in chapter 12 and verse 7, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. At the end of this book, that was one of his conclusions. And I want to tell you, if that's, if that's the best we can do, that's frustrating. The dust will return to the earth as it was, that's me, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. My spirit will return to God, but, but my body's going to turn to dust. And if that is all there is, that completely frustrates me. He would go on even to say this in the last part of this book. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. And I'm just going to say to you, all of these are signs of frustration. Now, may I say there are glimpses of hope? May I say to every single one of us this morning that there are certain things in our lives, as we do those things, there, there are things that bring us joy. And I'm not against those things. As a matter of fact, I'm for them. I want more of them. I mean, the more of them I can have, the better off I'm gonna, it's, my life is going to be. But ultimately, none of those things are going to last. All of those things are going to end up exactly where he says. Those things are nothing but vanity. And I think what he's saying here is not that they're unimportant and it's not that they're joyful, but they don't bring anything lasting to you. Every good thing that happens to you folks passes away. Every good feeling that you have about certain things, eventually it's not going to feel the same thing as it did when it first happened. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a ball game. I don't care if it's a wedding. I don't care if it's, if it's a promotion. I don't care what it is. How it makes you feel initially, it's not going to how it continues to make you feel. Because it can't fulfill you. <laughs> So whether or not a person wins or loses or whether or not a person achieves higher, more or less, that doesn't really matter. Not ultimately. Because all it does, folks, is bring you frustration. And so when he gets to the end of the book, here's what he says. He says, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs all of which to say he's still trying the preacher's trying and I think I do think it's Solomon he's still trying to figure out what it is that's going to bring satisfaction he sought to find the acceptable words isn't that interesting here's the wisest man who ever lived and he's trying to figure out what is it that I can say that are going to be acceptable that people will ponder that will make sense to people that's what he's saying 
And what was written was upright. They're, they're words of truth. What I'm telling you, he says, is true. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And furthermore, my son, be admonished by these. Of making of many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Once again, congratulations. There is no lasting purpose in this realm. Now, I don't know how that makes you feel. A lot of people who say the book of Ecclesiastes is about the, the most depressing book ever written. And I don't disagree. I don't disagree with it. Because even the very best things that happen to us have no lasting purpose. None. Not one thing. Which brings Solomon to this conclusion. Let us hear the conclusion. Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is man's law. This, this, is, this is really what is encompassed in all of us. This is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now what's interesting to me about all of this is... That what Solomon concludes, think about this. What Solomon concludes is, everything leads to final judgment. And he doesn't even hear, he doesn't even talk about that. He, he's, it's implied, but he doesn't explicitly say what has to happen. But he says, God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. And so there is this final destination that obviously we know from other scriptures has to do with either rewarding for one's life or being punished for one's life. But every one of us tries to find purpose. If you're younger, you're trying to figure it out. I get it. And if you're older like me, you spent most of your life trying to figure it out. And what we do, we, we meditate on whatever conclusions we have reached because we all want to find purpose. And Solomon gives, I think, in chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, I think what we see is that Solomon is saying, very early in the book, he's saying what he's going to conclude at the end. But what he's saying is, you have to know what God's purpose is for you. That's true wisdom. Let's read these verses. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that's done under the sun. I love this, this burdensome task. God has given to the sons of man, and to that I would say, Amen. By which they may be exercised. The word exercised means afflicted. I knew, I, I, knew, I knew exercise meant affliction, didn't you? When you exercise, what happens? You're afflicted, right? Well, we may be afflicted physically, but he says, that afflicts us emotionally. We're trying to figure this out, and yet it's an affliction. Verse 14, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What's lacking can't be numbered. And then in verse 16, he says, I communed with my heart. I love this language. I communed with my heart. I had to sit down with myself, and I said, self, that's what he's saying. Look, I have attained greatness, and I've gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge and I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly and I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Doesn't that make you feel a lot better? Verse 13, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things under the sun. Isn't that, what, isn't that what we all do? In your reflective moments, Drew talked about reflections this morning. In your reflective moments, aren't you trying to figure it out? May I suggest something to you? Everybody's trying to figure it out. Not just people who are sitting in an assembly, of, sitting in some church building this morning or some religious assembly. Folks, everybody's trying to figure out what life's about. Not just us. 
Not just religious people. Everybody's trying to do that. And so verse 18 says, In much wisdom is much grief. And if he, whoever increases in knowledge increases in sorrow. Well, thanks a lot. I can try to learn more about it, and I can. And I'm not going to be, feel much better about it. And so I, I would suggest this. I would suggest that Solomon is, is saying a couple things. Let me make two observations about this. First of all, his intent is not to disparage wisdom. He's not saying don't gain wisdom. That's not it at all. The wisdom literature, as we call it, right? Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Those five books that are packaged in the middle of our Old Testament, those five books we call wisdom literature. He's not, Solomon's not saying don't gain it. That's exactly what's given in those books. Solomon's problem is the problem that's common to every single one of us. There's not a person here this morning who's who's old enough to give thought to, why do I exist, who hasn't said, what's this all about? And the problem that he's trying to deal with is, how do I find the answers? And here's what he concludes. He's looking for answers apart from re revelation. I want you to think about that. I'm going, to make, I'm going to make three observations about this comment in just a minute. But he is looking for the answers apart from revelation and apart from God. So what's he doing? He is using his mind by itself to try to reach these conclusions about these issues of life. That can only be understood by using three things, not one thing. You got to use your mind. Yes, you got to use your mind, but you've got to use your mind to evaluate the revelation that God has given you. God made you, God has revealed Himself to you, so use your mind to understand what He's revealed. And then you have to accept it. Just because you've got a mind that can look at what the revelation is, you've got to accept it. So faith is involved with this. So the trio is your mind, revelation, and faith. Right? And everybody has that. Now the trio might not be the same, but everybody has that. Solomon was using his mind all along. He kept, you know, he kept saying, think about this. I tried, uh, I tried power. That's using your head. I tried, uh, I tried all things that were sensual. I tried to eat all I could. You know something, if you're the king, you can eat all you can. I mean, every day is a buffet, right? And when the buffet runs out, you just ask for another buffet. And Solomon basically did that. He said, I've got all I want to eat. I've got, I've, I've got as much, I've, everywhere I can, I can go, anywhere I, I go, and I can own it if I want it, basically. I can do everything that, is, that seems pleasurable to me. I can have it all. And he did. But when revelation and faith came into play, he, he realized that what I've been thinking about just using my mind is not good enough. Jeremiah would say it this way in Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. There is a way. You remember this? There is a way that seems right to a man. How can that happen? If, if, if all I'm using, if all a man's using is his own mind to figure out what's right, that's the way that seems right. But the end, Jeremiah would go on to say, but the end of that, he says, the end thereof is the way of death. I, I can choose never to, to follow God. I can choose not to believe in Him and not to follow what He says. That's fine. I have that choice. But the end result is you're going to die. And there's not going to be any purpose to what you even did. And I think that's, that's something that, that we've got to see. But, Men try to find wisdom without revelation. They try to, and I'm going to point out three things just very quickly to you this morning that I think really address this. The folly of wisdom without revelation. There are three results to this. First of all, let me suggest this. That there's a dangerous comfort that comes with this. Well, what do I mean by this? Well, I mean that everybody finds answers somewhere. You have to get along. You have to survive in the world 
And, and, and you've got to have faith in something. I mean, let, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's do this intellectual exercise. I know this may be hard, but I want you to try to do it. I want you to separate yourself this morning from everything you've ever thought, everything you believe, everything that affects you spiritually. Just separate yourself from that. Separate yourself from being in this location this morning. Put yourself, matter of fact, put yourself at your house right now eating a late breakfast. Or brunch, I guess we'll call it that. Put yourself there. Put yourself as, as never having thought about God. Never having done that. Think of all the funerals that you've gone to between this time and in the past. Think about all of that. But think about all of those funerals. In all of those funerals, what's being said is, well, he lived a good life, he lived a full life, and we'll miss him. Now I want to ask you a question. What's the point to that? What's the point to that? What Solomon says is, there is no point to that. Solomon's conclusion is without God, there is no point to that. There, and people, people, and, and there are a lot of folks. As a matter of fact, there are most folks today. They're not coming anywhere close to doing what we're doing. And just because we're doing it doesn't make us what God wants us to be. But I believe us assembling and us worshiping, I believe that's what he's, he asked of his people. I believe he asked, he asked, that's he, what he asked of all in, in, human beings. But everyone has faith in something or someone. And even those people who've never accepted God, never accepted the things of God, and don't even begin to understand their spirituality, even those people have to have answers. Most people separate themselves from God's revelation, but they attach themselves to some sort of hope. Now, how many funerals do you hear? Well... Uncle, Uncle Ben lived a good life. He never listened to God, so he doesn't have any hope, but he sure lived a good life. He had a good time living his life. How often do you hear that? You never hear that, do you? You never hear anybody. You never hear somebody who's giving a eulogy get up and say, well, they had a good life, but they got no hope, because they never listened to God. I mean, some of the worst people I've ever known if the preacher at their funeral has anything to do with it, they're already in the door at heaven. And I'm just thinking, you're kidding me, right? But that's because few people live without hope. And every single one of us, whether we're living according to what God wants or not, every single one of us create a success scenario, folks. In your own mind, if you're not doing what you ought to do, you've somehow rationalized it, I'm confident, to create some kind of environment in your mind that says, I'm good, I'm okay. Most people, even in death, have to find a comfort level. I've talked to enough people on their deathbed, some Christians, some not, and every single one of those people talk to me about why they think they're okay. Or is there something you can do to help me be okay? Would you pray that I can be forgiven? I mean, everybody's thinking that. Everybody's trying to figure those things out. But most of the time, for someone who's not a believer in Jesus Christ, most of the time, them trying to do that is not according to what God has revealed. It's not, it's not according to what God said. It's according to something I need at the time or something I want. Everybody wants that. So if you're going to discard what God said, you, you, may, you may get comfortable, but it's going to be dangerous. And then the second thing I would suggest to you is there is a repulsive arrogance that develops. You ever notice how people who don't know about God and don't care to know anything about the Bible have an intellectual disdain for the, those of us who do? You ever notice that? God-fearers and Bible believers are often seen as mental midgets to their peers. That they're often seen as, well, you've got to have faith in something bigger because you're not strong enough to do what? Let me tell you something. Nobody's strong enough 
You may have a dangerous comfort, but it's dangerous. It's not going to work for you ultimately. There is this intellectual disdain. And there is a behavioral disdain. No God and no revelation. What does that equal? Think about this. If there's no God and if there's no revelation, this is exactly what happens. There are no rules. There is no conformity to anything if there's no God and there's no revelation. Which is precisely what's happening in our world. No rules anymore. Nothing is wrong. Nothing is immoral. Nothing is a sin. Let me ask you this question. How often do you ever hear anyone say about someone's behavior, that is sinful? How often do you hear that? I'm not talking about, I'm talking about outside assemblies like this where I believe we teach what the Bible teaches and what the Bible teaches is we, we can sin and we can behave in ways that, are, that are, are God does not approve of and when that happens it is sinful but how often outside an assembly or a conversation that many of us would have how often do you hear people say well you, you, you don't be doing that, that's sinful or how about this term, well you shouldn't be doing that you shouldn't be living with that person because if you do that, that's immoral how often do you hear that term? I don't think you hear it much. I'll tell you who you hear it from. We hear it from each other, don't we? we? We talk about, well, that's immoral. We teach a Bible class. That's immoral. That's immoral kind of behavior. But let me tell you something. In casual conversation with most people, you never hear the word sin or you never hear the word immoral. Because without God and without revelation, there is no such thing. It's whatever I want, whatever I want to do. Which is exactly where we are in our world. And then finally, there's a bittersweet frustration. That's what happened to Solomon. He's frustrated. To a point. He's frustrated because nothing made any sense without God. There was no true fulfillment. And may I say to us, that's what frustrates all of us too. Every single one of us to some degree or another this morning, is frustrated by events in our lives. Now, some of us, hopefully all of us, are anticipating other events that, that kind of that kind of blunt the hurt and blunt the frustration. But when those events come, you know what's going to happen? They're going to come and they're going to go. And you're going to feel the same way that you did before you even thought about it. Because that's the way life is. Now, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. Sorry, Debbie. I'm not trying to be that. But that's the reality, folks. And the other side of this, this the other side of this bittersweet business is, is that Solomon, Solomon was grateful to God because as Solomon even said, God has set eternity in our hearts. So that we have a higher purpose, fuller purpose. Which is exactly why you're here this morning, and I'm here. That this, is a, that this assembly this morning is about fulfilling our purpose. Right? This is about us saying to God and answering God who has set eternity in our hearts, what we're doing here this morning matters to me, God. Because I've tried it without you and it makes absolutely no sense. So I'm going with you. I'm going with you. And now it makes perfect sense. It doesn't change a lot of things about life that, that frustrate me. It doesn't change any of that because life is frustrating. But it certainly changes my approach and it gives me the kind of hope. Why? Because that's what he said. I know what he said. Folks, if you, if you avoid God and if you avoid revelation... You may, you may muddle through life. You may get through it. And you probably will. You'll probably live a, a relatively full life in the sense of, of aging unless certain things happen prior to that. But it's never going to be full. Never going to be full unless you find God. And so I would suggest this morning as we conclude this lesson, if you're looking for purpose and that Search has never led you 
to God and his revelation. If that's never led you there, I'm just going to tell you something that will kind of save you some time. You're not going to end up at a good place. You're not going to end up at a good place intellectually, and you're not going to end up at a good place emotionally, and you're not going to end up at a good place eternally. Not until you listen to what God said. Or, or you can do what Solomon did. Now, you may not do it to the same degree that Solomon did. I, I, you're not going to do it. You don't have the means to do what Solomon did to the degree he did. None of us have that. I don't care who we are. We don't have that ability. Or we can just look at the wisest man who ever lived and say, this is, what he, this is the conclusion he reached. And we can accept that and go with that and live by that. And then when God does bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil, we can have confidence that we have done what our God has asked us to do. And we know that by His revelation. So if this morning, if there's somebody here who says, I'm tired of doing it my way, I've been trying to figure this stuff out, and I just keep staying frustrated, well, welcome to the club. You're going to stay frustrated until you turn yourself and your mind and your heart over to Jesus Christ. Then your frustrations will be maintained in the right kind of way. And ultimately they'll be gone when we're with God forever. I would love to and we would love to encourage you this morning. And Eddie's going to lead us in this invitation song. And so may I ask you this morning, if you're here and you need help with your spiritual life somehow, whatever the case may be, let us help you by pointing you to the one who can truly help you. Let that be known by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.